Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth annual edition of the Middle East Retail Forum. My name is Anish Trivedi. I'm going to be playing moderator for the next couple of days. I've had a chance to meet some of you and say hello, and hopefully uh, over the next 48 hours, I'm going to meet the rest. Thank you all for investing your time in what we expect are going to be two very energizing days, looking at new directions, looking at new horizons, innovation, exchange in retailing. So why are we here? We're here because the path to leadership in retail is no longer about competing in the way we used to. Yes, business leadership is still about competition. It's still about being better than the other guy. It's still about making sure that your brand succeeds like no other has ever. But let's face it, no retailer today knows everything there is about everything. And you can't get ahead on a silo approach. We've always been fond of saying that if I were to walk around this room right now, pull out my wallet, give you 100 dirhams, walk up to the next person and ask for 100 dirhams. At the end of the day, I would have 200 dirhams. You would have none. If, on the other hand, I were to walk around the room and exchange an idea with you and got one back, then we each have two ideas. It's a win-win situation, and that's what we're hoping for while we sit in this room. It's not just about what you bring to the table. It's not just about what you bring to the conference. It's about what you take away as well. We're in a connected consumer universe. We're staying in a one-upmanship mindset that could possibly leave you isolated and disconnected from, from changing consumer behavior today. It's smarter to get access to the industry's best practices, to share knowledge, share experiences, and hopefully together, outsmart today's highly savvy, well-informed, and demanding customer. We can only do that through the sharing of information and the insights to actively influence and manage shoppers' motivations, their inclinations, their paths to purchase, in conjunction with our peers and our channel partners. And that's why we're all sitting at the same table. We share our experiences to facilitate the growth of retail, and that's the mission of MRF over the next couple of days. Catalyzing profitable growth through knowledge sharing and in sync with that, the overarching theme of MRF 2015. Connect, share, evolve. Last year, the 2014 edition of MRF received exceptional feedback from our speakers, the supporters, the participants. This year, however, we've embedded some innovation into the format of MRF, making it hopefully even more engaging and interesting, ensuring that more and more people in the room are able to participate and share their experiences and knowledge with us. You'll notice that there are some of you sitting at tables around the room, and then you've got a whole bunch of people who have their backs to you. Um, what we're hoping for is not just have a bunch of PowerPoint presentations that take place at this podium. In fact, we're not going to have very much that takes place at this podium at all. The idea is to participate. The idea is to engage. The idea is to have a dialogue, not listen to lectures. Yes, there will be presentations. Yes, there will be PowerPoints. Yes, there will be speakers who do come up to the podium. But far more than that, it's about the industry leaders that we have in the room around that table who are going to be sharing their experiences, their thoughts, are going to criticize, are going to comment on whatever's being said over the next couple of days. And hopefully all of you in the room are going to do exactly that. Over the next two days, we've got six high energy, power packed roundtable discussions addressing all areas within the broad spectrum of retail. We've got the much awaited retail business owners and the CEOs conclave, the logistics conclave, technology, marketing, retail design, and shopping mall. And strangely enough, that's not all. Tonight, we're also going to be celebrating retailing excellence in the region 
by felicitating the top performing regional retailers at the fifth annual Images Retail Middle East Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin the fifth annual Images Retail Middle East Awards, we would like to thank the companies and institutions without whom this evening would not have been possible. This year, the Images Retail Middle East Awards features a first ever innovation. For the first time, the awards have been split into two distinct categories, the self-nomination awards and the industry nominated jury awards. In self-nomination, retailers were free to nominate themselves in any of eight categories, marketing campaign, social media campaign, retail launch, store design, online retailer, store design, store manager, CRM initiatives, and responsible retailer. For the industry nominated jury awards, for the first time, we conducted an extensive survey of shopping centers around the GCC to determine which re retailers in the region are leading in the main consumption categories, from fashion to leisure, beauty, entertainment, and food. We believe shopping centers are in many ways often the most astute observers of retailers' performances and how shoppers respond to these retailers. Shopping center developers and business heads across the Middle East were asked to rank the most outstanding retailers in their view, including those who are tenants in their centers as well as those who are not. These were then vetted by an independent jury consisting of shopping center industry veterans and experts. There is more excitement, ladies and gentlemen. At MRF 2015, we will launch the inaugural edition of Images Retail Middle East Coffee Table Book, Vision and Views, featuring 30 regional retail thought leaders. With any luck, you're not going to be hearing too much more from me, um, but we will, I promise you, have a very exciting two days ahead. Before we start our first roundtable for the day, we're very privileged to have with us Mr. Nasif Kayed, Managing Director of the Sheikh Mohammed Center for Cultural Understanding, who's here to share with us an inside view on the evolution of the Emirate and its multicultural fabric. Thank you, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I'm glad uh, you mentioned that we will not be a bunch of PowerPoints today and speakers on the podium, because that's one thing about me. I don't speak at the podium. I speak amongst the people. My name is Nasif Kaid, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Center of Culture and Understanding. It's really a concept of introducing our culture, history, heritage, religion to the people who come to the UAE. From many years ago, the people came here and had questions, and until today you have questions, and you are always afraid to approach us. I don't know why, but it is what it is. So like many of you has always say, uh, we've never seen an Emirati, uh, we've never met an Emirati, we've never touched an Emirati. Is that true for you? Is it true? Have you touched an Emirati? <laughs> Touch one here. To, uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, from silly questions such as, uh, are you all rich Arabs? That's what started me, and until today I'm perceived as an oil rich Arab. When I go to a Dubai mall, I could walk around like this and everybody perceives me as an oil rich Arab, and some of the tourists or even the expats who live here would love to have a picture with me. And I always say yes, of course, because I don't want the tabloids to write about us anything negative. There is plenty of it out there. But then sometimes I am bothered by the fact that I am, my time is being wasted on pictures and I have to go to where I have to go to. So therefore, all I have to do is just simply change the perception. But doing that, and then nobody talks to me anymore. They don't even look me in the eye. I even get ready of a long line <clears throat> at a nice restaurant by simply doing this and saying, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> open doors, open minds. It's an opportunity for me, folks, to get closer to you by simply explaining why the perception, why the misconception. Oil rich Arab, but you think that we started from oil. But let me ask you, and I ask these questions a lot. This region here, when did it start? What was life like before oil? How old is oil in this region? Uh, how many Arab countries are there? Does anybody really know how many Arab countries are there? Could somebody quickly like shout at me a number? How many Arab countries are there? How many? Anybody? My God, this is mid uh, retail Middle East, hello? Huh? 22. And if you accept South Sudan and North Sudan, now we just recently split them, that will be 23. Good? So, how many have oil? 
How many actually are oil giants, oil producers? Huh? Seven, eight, yeah, it, per perception. Again, people tell me about Qatar, UAE. I used to say when I'm from Dubai and nobody knew Dubai, and today people know Dubai but don't know Abu Dhabi much. Why? Because they don't know the places where there is oil, but they know the places where there is what? Interaction. And when you come to the UAE today, everybody thinks that this is oil money that we build Dubai with. But folks, from not too long ago, when we came to this region, we came not too far from a place where civilization started. I always ask the people, this is Earth, where did the human race begin? And they always tell me Africa. And my answer to you, why? We were all black, we became white. In my lifetime, only one black became white so far. Are you with me? <laughs> so, so how did this happen? But have you ever heard of a region called Mesopotamia or a civilization? Babylon. This is not too far from here today. It's called Baghdad, Iraq. Are you with me? <clears throat> In the old days, the Middle East was the really, really the vibrating place. The place where civilization began. I always say, if you go back to Noah, Adam, uh, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, Zechariah, Mary, peace be upon her, have these people ever been to Africa? Have these people, uh, people been uh, to Asia? But they lived in a place called the Middle East. We were all Arabs. We were all Muslims. Arabic is one of the main languages in the old days. Islam is the latest religion and the last and final one, updating what was pre previously before it. So when we start to talk about who we are here, we begin to get closer with you as the human race. As today we have borders, national anthem and flags and passport and visa. This is new. Who invented this, by the way? The British. And the French helped them out a little bit. It's a concept. Today we are differentiated uh, between one another by borders. But the fact when you come here, we migrated from whether it's called older civilizations such as Baghdad, Mesopotamia, Babylon. We came near the sea, the Gulf. Why did we come? Because we found pearls. And pearls was, uh, you know, an old profession from 7,000 years ago, 27,000, 2,700. It became really very, very prominent of, or part of retail uh, in the whole world. People wanted pearls. They came to us with boats full of goods. And those boats were either from Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia. And we ended up with goods that neither side had because we have what somebody else doesn't have. We ended up trading. And we ended up charging people small fees for bringing their goods to our. This is called Dubai Creek today, folks. 1,800 boats in and out still till today from the creek every month. The same idea when Sheikh Rashid took it to the next level when he wanted to build Jabal Ali port and everybody thought he was, he was crazy, he was hallucinating. What are you doing building a port in the middle of the desert? This has always been the issue with us. Whenever we build something, say we're crazy, all rich Arab, what are they gonna do in the desert? What are they doing? But really when Jabal Ali port was built today, it ranks what number, what, six, four to six? 1,352 containers every hour on and off. And by finishing up DP World or Maktoum Airport, it will be shipping containers to the rest of the world faster than anywhere else. This is your hub to redistribute your product throughout the world. So therefore today we call it what? Dubai Mall. Everybody comes to shop at a mall and buy goods that they don't have in their country. And so therefore retail in Dubai is here to stay. But for us how to make it cater to culture that is Emirati or Saudi or Gulf or Arab or Muslim. But then why not also to Japanese, Russians, Chinese, Indian, Huh? Why not to Africa and why not just cater to everybody? Everybody's coming to shop here. Everybody actually lives here. So therefore, to understand culture is very important. This is the role we play at Sheikh Mohammed Center of Culture Understanding. We don't just talk about Emirati culture, Arab Muslim culture. We talk about the human race, culture-wise. What makes us tick? What separates us? But what also connects us? And so therefore, today, when I'm talking to you about coming to Dubai, folks, when you establish a retail here, you must study hard how you can cater and please all societies and all levels. And so therefore, when you build a big mall like Dubai Mall and you build another retail place like that, that's fine. But also we need to revive the area of the old part of Dubai. As Miras today, I don't know if you know, familiar with the project, within a couple of years, Miras will be finished on the creek all the way down to Heritage Village. This is Sheikh Mohammed's vision of reviving this area and making it into what? A place where people will come to old Dubai, where we started. Uh, you have to uh, locate yourself there. 
And I'm telling you today, there are old shops, and these people have been handing over these shops from family to family, generation after generation. But you can begin to think, how can I bring my product in there? How can I bring my retail organization in there and begin to take over and make some space for myself? And so therefore, for us to cater, we always say, as Arabs, when I walk in, stop receiving me as oil-rich Arabs. Stop over-treating me. At the same time, don't treat me with fear and uh, prejudice. We have to really open up the subject matter and make sure that we are educated to where we treat these people as pair what? Just a normal human being. I understand dressing up like this, you think it's only us, but it's not. I always say, if you look at every picture of Jesus, peace be upon him, Moses, it's always like this in a picture, dressed completely. This is practical, this is modest. Practical, we cover from the weather element regardless of where you live. Modest, nobody can tell if you are rich or you're poor. Look, no Versace, no Armani, no Calvin Klein. See? If you are a sheikh, if you are a royal, it doesn't matter. We are all the same. So therefore, why the mistreatment? Why sometimes, yes, sir, hi, hi, come on. All overly exaggerated. We like just normal treatment, but we also like to be taken care of as a customer. Part of our culture is hospitality. And hospitality is you take care of the guest, regardless of their status, regardless of their color, regardless of their gender. But there is also an etiquette. When a woman approaches us, we are always what? We give you your space. I've never met you before. I do not come to, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Where are you from? It's good. Welcome to her. Why do you become so friendly? Do you like a strange man being so friendly to you like that? Actually, yes. Yes? Oh, let's talk outside after this. <laughs> but really, technically speaking, a strange man to a strange woman, do you like to be really, uh, you know, messed with? No. You, you, I don't know you. For, for the man, it's okay, no problem, right? You're okay. So the concept here is we have etiquettes. That's not because we are Arabs or Muslim. It is called female and male. We complement, we complete, we don't compete. It's a concept what we try to teach, rather than we always like when a woman walks in with abaya and a scarf, don't look in her eyes. Don't talk to her. Don't come near her. Why? So we have to stop the stereotype, we have to stop the scaring and the judging by the people of the way they look, the way they're dressed, where they're from. What status are they? Always people want to oversell me. I don't like it. So therefore, I put my Nikes, and they don't want to sell me anything. I'm like, I'm the same guy that was wearing Kandor a few minutes ago. Now I am wearing my Nikes, and nobody wants to sell me anything. I still, it's the same wallet. Just because I'm dressed like this, you want to sell me everything in the shop? Just because I'm dressed now with simple clothes, just like everybody else, now I'm not, I don't have money? And this is a concept also. We have to train our uh, uh, retailers, our uh, uh, merchants in how that uh, we have to stop this and we have to go to another level of being more civilized towards the way we treat each other. So the old market folks, you know, you have a pizza shop and you want to come. There is nothing wrong with also bringing the Emirati culture, the Emirati cuisine. I would like to see pizza with malih on it, you know what I mean? This is like dried fish, and I would like to see uh, a restaurant add uh, a dish that is Emirati. Why not? So therefore, you have a menu, you have Chinese, you have uh, Italian, uh, you have international food. You are living here in Dubai, in the UAE. You could have an element that has to do with the Emirati culture. Always people ask us, where can you eat Emirati food? I say, Sheikh Mohammed Center. <laughs> we are six days a week. We serve breakfast, we serve lunches, we serve dinners, brunches, and people love it. They sit and eat, and they have a conversation with us. And so the concept here really today, my talk is, I want to break this barrier between you and us. Everybody thinks we are a minority. I always say we're not a minority. We are about 9 million people in the UAE. The Emiratis, we are about 1 million. We don't have more than a million from any of the cultures. But we combine everybody and say UAE and 1 million and 8 million. Why do you combine everybody else and ostracize us and or, you know, uh, make us like our own? We are all together here to make a living and enjoy. All two people said crazy old rich Arab seven-star hotel. What are they going to do with it in the desert? Then they said, oh, minus 40 degree ski resort in the middle of the desert. Outside is 123, inside is minus 40. Who's going to go there? Right after that, we rolled out what? Palm Jumeirah. Because we knew when the people started talking, we're getting attention. People ask me, why do you build the biggest? Why do you build the tallest? I say, because it's free marketing. We invest our money in the project, and all the media advertise for us free of charge. I don't have to put money in marketing. It is advertised for already. I just build it. So really, it's a concept today of to really revisit the way we perceive things from negative to positive and from uh, aggravation or uh, short-term opportunity to long-term opportunity. This region is here to rise. 
in my view, in my opinion, the way things are going right now. So people, when they come, and it's always new retail. Old retail is important, folks. Old retail needs to be revived. Old retail needs to become part of your <coughs> excuse me, future plan. And so therefore, how do we cater to Muslim or Emirati or Arabs? We have one and a quarter million Saudis come to this place. We need a prayer hall in the mall. We need somewhere where we can make ablution. So the bathroom cannot just be bathroom with sinks and stalls. It needs to cater for people to make ablution or you have an ablution. We need a place where there is kids. Everybody here is families. Somewhere where the kids can have a break. We need a place where we could sit. The problem with some of our old souks or our old markets, there is not enough place to rest. There is not enough places to where you can just take a break with your family. Drinking, water, you only can buy and sometimes you cannot even find restrooms. You cannot find enough restrooms. So all this becomes a challenge. So as a Muslim, as an Arab, as an Emirati, as a GCC, uh, if I come, I just uh, was meeting last night, I was having dinner at our center with the CEO of Orange County. Orange County realized by not catering to the Arabs, to the GCC people, they're losing a lot of money. And everybody there think that we are terrorists. He said, this is money, money. How, how could you think terror? We need their money, we need them to come and visit us, we need them to come and spend money with us. So we made a video for them. If you go to YouTube, uh, we have it, Orange County and Middle East, where I explain to them everything from the way we dress, the way we believe, uh, how to, when I walk into your retail space, do you know east from west? I want to pray. Can you tell me where to pray? Uh, you, your, your clients uh, needs to be taken care of sometimes. What are some of the questions they come to you with your retail space and they ask you? And so therefore, are you able to inform me? Are you able, you know, the other day, a lady in the heritage area, Al Fahidi area, she was trying to find a place to feed her baby. We invited her into our center and we said, please have a seat in one of the rooms, close the door, go ahead, enjoy yourself. This is really what makes us connect with each other and makes our retail successful and makes me also want to come back to your retail establishment because you cater to all my needs, regardless whether they are something that you consider important or not, but it's going to build over time. When I know that this place caters to all my needs, I'm going to tell my friends. This is like when we went to America and my wife was pregnant and she wanted to do an OPGYN. And we couldn't find a female, we only found males. And she said, honey, well, let's go back home. I'm not going to go to a male OPGYN. And I'm talking to you bluntly here. We kept looking, looking, an hour and 15 minutes away from the city where we were, there was a lady who was an, we made advertisement for her amongst the whole Muslim community. She became very rich because of us. I never got my percentage from it, but. <laughs> but this is a concept. So today, really, again, you know, for us, uh, if there is anything we could do at Sheikh Mohammed Center of Culture Understanding to do culture induction for your staff, to help you in the way that you design your establishment and how it caters, what are some of the questions you have that we can answer for you? We are saying that Muslims need to be catered to. Christians need to be catered to. Hindus and Buddhists need to be catered to. It's their right to believe. I know we don't believe we are atheist agnostic, but can we have respect for those who chose to have faith? They respect us. If I am agnostic or atheist, I know that Muslims don't mind me at all. So therefore, why do we mind them? We must keep them in mind. That's really what's important. We have to cater to the fact that there is a woman dressed completely and she is covered and her face is covered. I always say, don't worry about it. Her face on the passport picture is not covered. Is it covered on the driver license? It's not covered. So therefore, if you were to be nice and kind, she will probably uncover her face and talk to you. But how many of you become disappointed and prejudiced and absolutely uh, out of your mind when a lady or a gentleman walks into you with sunglasses inside your shop? How many of you have signs that says, no sunglasses inside our mall? We need to see your eyes. None of us. So therefore, what's wrong with her coming in with her face covered? You actually could see her eyes. I'd rather see eyes when I talk to people rather than see mouth and nose. Seriously. So really, again, the concept of how can we revisit where we made a big deal out of absolutely nothing and made it into very negative, and so therefore can we treat everybody as a human being and accept them and look forward to their what? Becoming a customer of ours, and what can I do for you to enjoy shopping at my retail? So therefore, please visit everything, and we can help in any way, which way we can. But at the end of the day, bring the barrier down and allow yourself to see beyond. Just like the concept of all rich Arabs is what got me started in this open doors, open minds. The door is open for us to talk. Open minds is that do we know how to discuss a concept or a, a subject matter? Everybody asked me, why white? I went and asked my dad, why white? He said, what do you mean? I said, why do we dress white? Six GCC country, we all wear white traditional dress. He said, why? What color do you want? 
I said, Dad, I'm serious. I'm asking you a serious question. Why did we pick white out of all the colors? He said, no, really, what's wrong with white? What's wrong with it? I said, you don't know, do you? And so you're lashing out at me. Frustrated, I asked everybody, and I asked all the time, why do we wear white? People give me silly answers. So I turned around and I went to people and I said, why blue jeans? Any idea? Why jeans and why is it blue? I've been talking for more than 20 years to all levels of society, from the politicians to the average. Why blue jeans, guys? Why is it jeans and why is it blue? Why gray or navy business suits? See, people told me, why didn't you wear white and you make your women wear black? I say, really, we make our women wear black. I, I don't know what's wrong with black, but let me ask you this. How many of you are men here? Raise your hand if you tell your wife what to wear every day. How many of you? How many of you, your wife tells you what to wear? Come on now. <laughs> Seriously. And so therefore, what's wrong with black? Oh, it's hot. Seriously, it's hot. Why is it hot? Um, because it's hot, it attracts heat, it observes heat. Are you sure? So why do you think we make them wear it? To torture your women, you are mean men. I say, well, let me just get along with you since the conversation is already decided. I explain to you, our women, they torture us inside the house, we torture them outside. <laughs> we get even. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. You know, ordinarily, when we start with the opening speaker, you get a whole bunch of statistics. You get told how the economy is going. You get told how the growth rates and GDP is going to go over the next few years. This has got to be the first opening session that I've heard Michael Jackson mentioned. <laughs> But we do have Mr. Kayad with us for a couple of questions. The takeaway for most of us um, is not just about the culture. It's not just about, about respect for another religion, another society. It's about understanding who your customer is. It's about taking that data that SAP is going to give you and say, can I mine it down to understanding who this person in the white or the black or the pink, or the green, or the blue jeans really is. Do I, do I assume, as we were, we were talking over a cup of coffee with the gentleman from SAP, um, do I send out 100,000 emails just because I've collected those emails and those phone numbers and those SMSs, which tell me what shade of lipstick I should be buying still because once I walked into Sephora and bought stuff for my daughter. And I still get those damned emails and I still get those SMSs. So are, we, are we just not understanding our customer? Are we not understanding our consumer? And hopefully over the next couple of days, that's exactly what we're gonna try and boil it down to. How do we understand that person who walks in through our stores, walks in through our doors, comes onto our website, how do we understand him, her better? Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open. Any questions? Any comments? Anyone want to do a break dance? Michael? Michael, can you hit your mic button, please? remind all of us what's really important uh, in this life and any other lives that we may have. So that, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to move away from the top of the table over there. Um, because it's really frightening to be sitting over there and then see this massive image of you right on the screen where it's facing you. So what I'm going to do, and I did walk around and meet a bunch of you earlier, so now I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves to everyone else around here. Tell us why you're here, what you do, how you're going to make a difference over the next couple of days. You're up. My name is uh, Lama Bazari. I'm CEO of Install International. Uh, we have about uh, 30 stores across the Middle East and in North America and Canada. 
um, delighted to be here. I've been participating in Retail at Me for several years. Uh, we are very passionate about uh, our industry and in retail. Uh, we cater predominantly for the female consumer. We have about 50,000 uh, female customers that walk into our stores across the Middle East and North America on a monthly basis. So we are uh, always looking at ways to uh, offer them a better uh, uh, consumer experience in our stores, value add for their dollar, for their dirham if they visit us. And uh, I look forward to sharing my experiences with you all. Terrific. Thank you, Lama. Hannes, you're up. I've already said nasty things about SAP. Thank you very Make much. Make a difference. <laughs> Much appreciated. Thanks for having me here. My name is Hannes Liebe. I'm the COO and Managing Director for SAP in the Middle East. And you might wonder, what is the tech guy sitting here in the United Nations of retail? Yeah. And the, the reason is, um, as SAP, we work with about 12,500 retailers in the world. Uh, we work with many of the retailers here in the Middle East as well. And the Middle East for us is a strategic region. I, I could relate very well with you and Asif when you were talking about this, that um, every region for us is very different and we have to take a very different approach as well to this, respecting the local culture and as well the lo how businesses are run uh, in the specific regions. Middle East for us is very strategic, but technology will change the way we will do business, uh, I believe, going forward. And this is regardless whether this is the way SAP will do business or how retailers will do business going forward. And why is that? We live in an era, I believe, where uh, the, the biggest accommodation provider is Airbnb and doesn't have a hotel bed. We live in an era where one of the biggest retailers in the world doesn't have a warehouse. Uh, look at Alibaba. Yeah. Uh, we look at an era where the biggest taxi company doesn't own a single taxi. It's Uber. So why, therefore, I believe it's relevant that SAP is here um, at a table of the industry leaders of retail in the Middle East. I believe if, if you're not thinking of how you can Uber someone, you might get Ubered by someone going forward. And technology I'm, I'm not you. sure you can actually say that in public. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but technology is going to be the key to that, and that's why I believe uh, we can make a relevant contribution in partnering with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Hi. Um, Isa Babani, I'm uh, one of the founders and the owner of El Menar Food Company, which owns, in 2004, we owned uh, a cookie brand, which we were, um, me and two employees, uh, back then, 2004. Since then, the, the, the company by itself having a competitive edge product. Now we own around two companies in the Gulf region, from three employees to 650 employees, from one small store to around 52 big stores, from a capital of 4,000 KD, which is around 50 dirhams, to a capital of uh, around uh, 35 million KD, which is around 400 million dirham. All of this because we believed in who we are, all of this because we believed with the team and having a competitive edge project, uh, product. And uh, w the main reason I always speak about in any business that we bring smart people in to teach us. We bring smart people in in order for them to tell us what we are doing wrong. And this is one of the main reasons why we are successful in this business because we partner up with what I call not a strategic partner, but strategic human resource in terms of to teach us exactly what needs to be done. It's not only about the owner, it's not only about the founder, it's about our partners and the company who make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Adul? Uh, hi, my name is uh, Adil Rashid. I'm the CEO for High Design in the Middle East. We are an international uh, leather manufacturer. We are present across uh, uh, 25 countries and we have 85 uh, standalone stores. We are uh, presently launching in the Middle East and uh, as the title very much says, I've come here to connect, share and, and evolve to an extent because we are new in this region. A uh, little history about the brand, we started in 1978 uh, it was a two-people two workshop and today we have over 3,000 uh, staff 
and I guess I'll uh, discuss further as we move along. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Debbie? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Debbie Stanford Christensen. I'm the CEO of Novo Cinemas. Um, I'm here, well, I, I was fortunate to be here last year, and uh, I found it a very worthwhile experience. We've already uh, started working with uh, two of the people that, two of the participants who were here last year. So for me, it's about a networking opportunity, um, a learning opportunity. At the end of the day, we're all here to focus on the customer, the customer journey, the customer experience. Customer is king. We have to make sure we look after them. So I'm here to uh, network with my peers to learn, uh, to engage, and to really understand and how we can develop and uh, give a better service and uh, experience for our customers going forward. Thank you, Debbie. That's a great endorsement. If you can actually say, I came back because I found the last year so worth it, um, it speaks a lot for the environment that we're trying to foster over here. So hopefully um, those of you who are here for the first time are going to come back next year with the same story as Debbie's. Jeremy? Hi, good morning. My name's Jeremy Johnston. I'm also a, somebody that's returning, I think, for the second or maybe even the third time. Um, I'm the CEO of a business that's primarily based in Saudi, but we have around 300 stores across the GCC, and we're slowly building a business that's going into the wider MENA region. Our business, you may not have heard of it in the UAE, because we only have a little presence here at the moment, but it's called Zuhur Al Reef which means, for those of you that don't know your Arabic, means flowers of the country, but we don't sell flowers. We sell body care, perfume, and home fragrance. And if you want a quick and simple idea of what our stores are like, think of us as a kind of Middle Eastern version of the body shop. So I'm here to learn, to pick up some new ideas, and I'm obviously very happy to share some ideas of my own as well, and uh, look forward to meeting everybody later in the day. Thank you, Jeremy. Rukhan? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Furkan Atar. Uh, I have grown in the region. I was born over here. I've been brought up over here, and I've evolved with the region, like um, Threen was saying. In 1998, I was one of the first employees of the Dera City Center, and for the past 15 years, I have grown with all of these malls and the retail that's happened in Dubai. I've started my own retail business. I have worked in malls. I have uh, set up concepts which include a school in a mall, music in a mall, and God knows what else in a mall. And I have what is called mall area. So I'm here to learn because there is no end to learning and you people are the ones who have actually set up the retail and made it interesting. So it's going to be a great experience for two days. Thank you. Anita? Hello. Um, my name's Anita Baker. Um, I'm from Lush Fashion Made Cosmetics, uh, primarily a UK brand to start off with. Uh, we're about 20 years old now. Uh, we're in um, over 900 shops in over 50 countries throughout the world, um, with about 25 across the MENA region at present. Uh, our brand sales last year were over £500 million, and we have um, ambitions to not only grow the business worldwide, uh, but also here in the MENA region. So we hope to double those stores over the next three to five years. Perfect. Mahbub? Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Mahbub Murshed. Uh, 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 I'm a managing director from Alpen Capital Middle East. It's a boutique investment bank. We have been in business for the last 10 years. Uh, we are present across the region uh, and also in India. Uh, in our business, we have two verticals. One is the debt, where we arrange funding for the clients, and also we have the equity piece, where we help clients to buy or sell companies. And in, in both the uh, verticals, we closely work with the retailers, and uh, we always interact with them, get their perspective. So many business leaders are here in the retail space. Uh, hopefully, it will help us to understand better, to cater the, to the requirements, both on the equity and the debt space. Perfect. So if you can't get customers, you, work, you can still get money. <laughs> Kunal? Hi. Um, my name is Kunal, and I'm the CEO for The Luxury Closet, which is an online marketplace for uh, luxury items. And each month, we bring in and send out uh, thousands of luxury items from uh, name brands uh, like Louis Vuitton Cartier uh, from, up, from the Gulf and then to the Gulf and across the world. Uh, last year, we sent items to more than 40 countries. Um, I'm here to uh, learn more about retail. Um, it's very successful here. Um, online is really taking off uh, in the last few years. I'm here to learn and understand more why people are still going to Dubai Mall and Mall of Emirates. Um, and to perhaps take some of these things uh, that could be applied to online retail and uh, help the industry go further. Perfect, Kushit. 
Good morning. My name is Kurshid Wakil, and I am the co-founder of Marina Home Interiors retail uh, chain. Uh, we have been in existence for the last 18 years in the region, having started from Dubai. Um, over the last 18 years, we have seen exponential growth in our business, not only in the UAE, but in the region and other markets. And we strongly believe that this growth has been a result of our interaction and our understanding of the customers, their likes, their dislikes, their purchase patterns, etc. Um, much like Dubai in, in particular, we have uh, taken a path of uh, a certain evolution uh, within our merchandise mix um, and the general look and feel of our stores that we, we would like to, to be more and more experiential year after year for the customers. We believe gone are the days that customers can come into your store, you know, thinking they would buy. They have a choice. They have a, a lot of choice. And we cannot be complacent in today's market by thinking that we have known it all and we can do it all. I think experiential retail is the way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kushit. And then you've got Kunal next to you who's trying to make sure that people don't walk into your store oh, and, they, okay. and they get the experience where he is instead. Ian? Uh, hi, good morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ian Ohan. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Freedom Pizza, uh, which is a subsidiary of a wholly owned company, uh, KRSH Investments. Um, we're a food and beverage business. I've been here for 18 years so uh, and had uh, different businesses in different sectors, and I do remember visiting your warehouses very early on and bought furniture from them, and the experience has changed dramatically, as has many things in the Middle East. Um, we are a carry-out and delivery pizza chain. Uh, we have a very big focus on a healthier product. Um, we're developing new concepts. We have 250 employees. We're sort of the Aramex of pizza. Um, and so we have a very big delivery focus and expertise. We're de uh, developing new concepts. We also are uh, distributors for, uh, we're becoming regional distributors for food products. Um, and we have an institutional food catering division as well. Um, and I'm here to learn uh, from the experience of others about how to take a local brand um, international, regional and international. Sounds perfect. Mark? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm afraid I'm one of those horrible things, another technology company uh, representative. So I'm the director of retail solutions for Zebra Technologies, probably a name many of you have not heard of, although most of you probably use our technology somewhere in the business. Um, we bought the enterprise business from Motorola Solutions uh, last year, and Motorola is probably a name you, you do recognize a lot more. Um, I guess over the next couple of days, and I'm another one of the returning uh, people, so uh, we certainly found it valuable last year. Over the next uh, couple of days, I'd certainly like to explore more about experiential retail, uh, because I think the challenge there is the cost, the challenge of, uh, of breaking down silos, the challenge of legacy systems, how do you move forward and try and get one view of the customer. We can talk about understanding our customers, but actually, who owns the customer within the organization because we're also seeing a lot of uh, different business titles and roles now popping up within, within retail organizations so, such as uh, chief customer officer. Uh, and is that role required or actually is everybody a chief customer officer? So uh, I think we should uh, look at areas like that as well. Thank you. Perfect. Amitabh? <coughs> Good morning. My name is Amitabh. I head the images group uh, in India and the Middle East. I'm uh, basically somebody who's here to help you really uh, meet a lot of new people, uh, listen to some great ideas. We've lined up a great uh, number of speakers and interesting presentation, which we'll see over the next two days. The basic idea is to really help you actually drill into you that technology is going to change the way any business is going to take place in the future. That's what we are trying to go, uh, do in the next two days. The customer is not changing. He has changed. That's what we are going to try and bring onto the table. 
uh, and that's my role to really help you meet new people, new ideas, and really uh, make sure when you go back, you realize that if you do anything tomorrow onwards, you have to think technology. Technology has to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Amitav, go back. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ulugbek uh, I'm from iWork.com. Uh, basically, uh, iWork.com was founded uh, two years back uh, with only three employees, and uh, currently we have 300 employees. Uh, nowadays, iWork.com is changing its business model from uh, just being the e-commerce company to the marketplace. And it's not simply a marketplace. It will be the first artificial intelligence, which is fully, uh, we want to put it inside our engine, like predictive uh, uh, model of that. So that's why, like, uh, our purpose to being here is to understand uh, basically the what is going on in retail business, uh, to understand the customer, uh, which is uh, tomorrow we can use in our uh, system, which is we are calling nowadays AIS, artificial intelligence system uh, of a work. So that's the like basically to, we came to get the better experience, understand uh, other retailers how they are doing, and of course uh, getting the network, uh, getting the new uh, people into our uh, we can say community of online business. Thank you. Thank you, Shivan. Hi, good morning. Uh, this is Shivam, uh, Shivam Sharma. I'm CEO of Sana Fashion. Uh, Sana Fashion is one of the oldest uh, uh, value uh, fashion retail chain in this region. It started with 1987. I've been very fortunate that we are a bunch of uh, uh, some 80 odd retail professionals who have joined hand together and we have led uh, Sana Refresh. We have brought in new, uh, new merchandise, new look and feel. We have refreshed everything <coughs> what Sana used to be before. and. Uh, we are calling it Sana Reborn. And uh, as Sana Reborn, we are one year old, though we are more than 25 year old company. So as a newborn baby, I want to learn and understand from you all during this participation. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Michael? Uh, yeah, Michael Yander. Uh, I'm here because about 10 years ago, I completed a job for some of my clients, which included Bang & Olufsen and Philips, that allowed us to communicate uh, personalized and customized offers based on triggers and regular programs. And I've been wondering ever since, why is it that no one takes that aspect serious? Why is it that everyone seems to be very busy with all the new technologies rather than fixing the very core of their marketing foundation, which would involve the data side of that? So that's why I'm here and, uh, of course, to learn whatever else is going on in this region. Perfect, thank you. Thomas? Good morning, my name is Thomas Lundgren. I took the wrong flight, 1985. I took a flight from Sweden to Saudi, that's how I am here. And um, I started work for a company called IKEA. We are, don't talk about that company in my company. My company is called The One. We are a chain of furniture stores. We started in Dubai. Um, I came from um, Saudi to Kuwait, Kuwait to Dubai in 93. I walked around in Dubai and tried to find money to start my dream. And everybody looked at me and they said, little, little Thomas, you can't do this. Uh, they said, the whole Sharjah is full of furniture stores. I said, no, 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 they are traders. They are commodity salesmen in deep denial. They are not retailers. And we had this conversation going on for two years and then I found some money and we started in 1996. We have uh, 22 stores, 26 stores, uh, hard to count. Uh, we are in 10 countries. We are the number one company to work for uh, and great places to work as a local company. We are doing, we are leader for sure in CSR. We hire handicapped people. We uh, do a lot of local volunteering, building schools. That's all fine, but my dream of saving the world from IKEA is not going to happen because they are far ahead of me. <laughs> so that's why I need a new disruptive technology. You know, the whole thing that makes scarcity, uh, to, you can look at the world in two ways, I think. The scarcity or there is abundance. And really, I need a new technology so I can be the new Uber and save the world from IKEA. That's why I'm here. So it's not about scarcity or abundance, it's about opportunity. Absolutely. Is it? 
Hi. Uh, good morning. I'm Ziad Mata. Um, I'm from Boutique One Group. We set up about 15 years ago uh, in Dubai, and uh, we're now operating uh, throughout the Middle East, and we've entered the UK market last year. We focus on uh, luxury fashion uh, retailing, both offline and online, um, and both through uh, multi-brand stores as well as mono-brand stores, which tend to be franchise or joint ventures with, uh, with the brands. Um, I'm here to, to, to learn. This is my first time uh, in this conference, so um, I'll, I'll try to share my experiences, but hopefully um, take home quite, quite a few things as well. Perfect. Thanks. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Jones, uh, founder and CEO of Mini Exchange. So Mini Exchange, a little bit different to the bricks and mortar stores out here, is an online marketplace for everything mums and kids. So we operate in both the outlet space and also the full price space, and we connect consumers direct to the actual product themselves. So we work with about 310 brands out here. We have about 30,000 products on the site, and we work with a lot of the stores in Dubai malls and also a lot of the distributors that supply those stores in Dubai mall and actually list those products online so that we can deliver them on a dropship model direct to the customer. Um, so I was here last year, I'm a bit like Debbie, um, made a lot of good connections, enjoyed meeting a lot of people here. Um, we launched 18 months ago, have just completed um, a round of fundraising and, um, and are now looking to expand um, quite aggressively outside the UAE into the other Middle Eastern countries. Perfect, thank you. Raju? Good morning. My name is Raju Shroff, I'm from the Regal Group, uh, which is a family business which has been in Dubai since 1952. I'm one of the oldest textile dealers, uh, retailers, distributors, and inventors here. Uh, we are uh, in Saudi, Qatar, India, and UAE, and uh, joined the family business a long time ago and trying to learn how to take it to a different level with technology. Textile uh, retailing and distribution is a very traditional old business, and uh, the purpose of me being here is to learn how to evolve that to a different level with technology. Thank you. Thank you. And just, just one yep. more comment. When he's talked about white in Kanduras, I sell that. But there are five different whites when people wear white. Bluish white, yellow white, cream white. So I'll have to have a chat with him and understand why white. <laughs> you know, there's actually, there's actually a, a client of, of mine um, in India. They have one store. That's it. They are never going to have more than one store. All they sell are shirts. They will never sell anything but shirts. And I walked in, and he's trying to explain to me, and the whole experiential uh, engagement with the customer, he's trying to tell me uh, how they are so different. And I said, all right, how are you different? And he says, so what do you ordinarily wear under, under your suit? A white shirt? And I said, yes. He says, how many white shirts do you have? And I said, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so. And he goes, come, let me show you our white shirts. They have 26 different shades of white. I have never quite understood this, but 26 different shades of white. You're absolutely right, Raju. Yes, Reen? I can never do what he does. We sell 360,000 different products, so that would bore me. Uh, my name is Nasreen Shokir. I'm the president of Virgin Mega Stores in the Middle East. Uh, we have 40 stores in nine countries. Um, I came to this market nine years ago, so it's nice to see so many familiar faces in the room. And also new people, uh, technology, mini exchange, uh, luxury closet, and in some ways it's been very exciting to see how the model in retail is changing. Um, nine years ago, the Virgin Mega Stores were stores that sold CDs and DVDs. I uh, came in and saw a huge opportunity with age compression in this market and young people to really focus in on the youth segment. Today, 90% of our customers are under the age of 29. They come to Virgin Megastores three times a week to see what's new. They spend between half an hour and 45 minutes. And why do they do that? It's really all about the experience, as Debbie said. Uh, we sell experience first, and then we sell product second. I think that that's very important going forward when people have options to go online, uh, to, to shop and ship, to buy through Amazon, or buy from your local mall or local store, then we need to be able to provide a lot more than that. And we've always believed in the concept that you sell people on the environment, you give them the opportunity to try things and test things, and then they'll keep coming back for more. Um, I said before, we do not sell anything that a customer really, really 
needs, but we sell 360,000 different items that they really, really want. So I'm on the hit list of every parent um, in, in this market. But it's a fun job. Um, I think that if you walk through the stores, you see the energy, the staff. Uh, something was said before about how we should not be uh, always afraid of the customer. And we see this a lot when we employ um, our staff. They're always scared of the customer. So one of the main mandates we always have in, in who we hire and how we train is to give them and empower them to make decisions, to say yes, to say no, uh, to really give that customer instant satisfaction on the spot if something is going well or, or not going well. Uh, we've been growing. We're the franchisee and the franchisor. And uh, it's been a phenomenal success story for us internally as a business. And every single year, I see new opportunities and new challenges. Last year, we launched a new concept for Virgin in Abu Dhabi. It's called Fast Forward. So it's a concept that's uh, fashion, beauty, cosmetics, footwear, accessories, in addition to technology and everything else that you know Virgin to have. It's been trading extremely well. Um, sales are 50% of Dubai Mall even in this market, even as a new mall. So that's a concept that you're going to see roll out more and more. Uh, in a month's time with SAP, we'll be launching our e-commerce site, or what we call our multi-channel. It's mobile first, because we know that customers are purchasing online first. And we see it as a, as a perfect hand-in-hand -hand with our stores. It's been a, not that I'm pitching SAP, but it really has been a phenomenal experience working with Hybris, and um, we were their first customer in this region. So we're very excited about that new milestone and the growth that's going to come from online going forward. Thank you. Perfect. Hannes, would you like to give her her check right now or wait until lunch? <laughs> so as you, can, as you can tell, for those of you who, who aren't sitting with your backs to the audience, um, we do have a great couple of days ahead, and I do hope that you're going to get a chance to hear more about some of the stories that we've heard, share some of your stories, uh, and bring that same excitement uh, that I'm feeling to the rest of the room as well. I'm going to introduce someone now who's actually been rather modest um, while I was going around with the microphone. Um, he's actually helped a number of leading global brands something he didn't mention, including Samsung, IBM, Nestle, Unilever, Americana. He's helped them embrace change to implement marketing programs that have delivered some pretty impressive returns. He is a seasoned multi-channel marketer. He advocates the importance of customer centricity, smarter marketing automation, and more importantly, a realistic approach to a return on marketing investment. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Michael Leander. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's interesting traveling around the world, talking to professional executives just as yourselves. Uh, what kind of conversations are going on uh, is one thing, but what sense of urgency do people feel and about what? So in the past month, uh, if I remember correctly, I've been to uh, countries in uh, the Americas, in uh, Asia, in Europe, and spoken to quite a few retail executives. And the sense of urgency that they feel, in my opinion, unfortunately, is about all the new shiny objects. As I mentioned briefly earlier, it's not about leveraging the opportunity to finally get their marketing foundation in place. Uh, just a moment, we'll do it when the video plays. Uh, let me put this here. So I'm here to share just a few stories. Uh, I'm not here to give you solutions. Uh, I'm not here to preach. I'm just here to give you a few stories that hopefully, along with all the other information you're going to receive today and tomorrow, will help you understand where exactly to leverage a sense of urgency. Uh, I should mention, though, before we start, that I'm a huge advocate of getting the marketing foundation in place. The reason is because I've built my own companies and sold them because of that, and I've helped clients around the world do the same thing. So let's uh, get the slides started. They're already there. And let me show you the first video. Play voicemail. Message one. Hey, this is Dave. Stop. Uh 
Delete. Message two. Hello, Mr. Carlson. Your reservation request for February... Stop. Delete. Message three. Yeah, Terry, that meeting at four has been moved up to noon. Call me as soon as you can. Warning. Breakdown imminent. Car track recommends immediate service. Oh no, my meeting. <laughs> To locate your nearest service station, turn right at Alameda. Continue north for one mile. Turn left at Hershey. Proceed two miles to the next service station. Hi. Hi. Terry Carlson? Uh, yes. Car track alerted us you're on your way. I've got your paperwork ready to go if you'll just sign right here. Great. Well, I guess all I need now is a cab. Car track has arranged for a cab to pick you up, Mr. Carlson. I guess all I need now is a million dollars. Can't blame a guy for trying, right? So uh, just, I, I realize I have very short time. I usually do short keynotes, 40, 40 minutes, otherwise two, three days of, of training. So uh, just let me ask you real quick. Does anyone know when this video was created, and I should mention when it was created, all of what you saw was possible, not even very difficult. Any guesses? 10 years ago. 10 years ago? 10? Anyone here? Rather not say, did you say, did you say 15? 15, 15 said over here. 18 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, 18 years ago, all of this was possible. Slightly on the expensive side back then, today much more possible. Many more people have the skills to make this happen, many more people are somewhat interested in data or can relate to the data that are required to make this happen. So I would like to say, ask yourself, is this going to be my vision for your vision for what you're about to do over the next two to three years? Would you like to provide this sort of somewhat automated yet personalized customer experience? I think the money here is not in those visions and big talking, big English words or whatever they are. It's all about how the heck do we make this happen? What do we need to do? Where do we need to invest? Where do we need to train people in order to make this happen? So let me give you a few more uh, insights. First of all, I'd like you to, to remind you that whenever a new project, a new investment starts, we all start in exactly the same place. We think we don't because we think that Virgin Megastore is like a huge company, they can do whatever they want. Or a small company uh, born on the internet over here can't do so much because they're a small company and they don't have so much cash and so many people. But reality is different now. We all start the same place with the same white canvas. What decides our success is what we do with that canvas, the decisions we make about what we are going to do. You're all successful people, so you know this. And when it comes to communication and the customer experience, you have to find a way to marry these two. And that comes as a result of really caring very deeply about what decisions you make that's going to fill in whatever it is that you're going to fill up this uh, canvas with. Uh, I want to mention as well that uh, we can all dream anything is possible regardless of our industry, the size of our company, our experience. Think about the engagement ring. I think it's a concept all over the world, right? And I think what we've forgotten is it was a marketing ploy by De Beers. The, how many people in the room knows this? Story only very few. And it wasn't just that the idea, the concept of, a, of an engagement ring that the beer seeded in people's minds. It was also this terrible notion that to be a real man, you had to spend a minimum of two months' salary. If you didn't, you weren't a real man. You didn't love her enough. Thankfully, when I got engaged, my wife never heard about this, so I got away <laughs> cheaper, let's put it that way. So these types of things are fully possible if you leverage 
the knowledge that we have about where the future is going. They say Gartner, excuse me, that was Forbes, <laughs> Forbes and Sidecore said in a survey that, or found in a survey that by 2020, customer experience is expected to surpass product and pricing as the key business differentiator. I think in many industries it's already happening, right? Because you have some smaller, leaner startups that are actually able to develop a culture and a setup that is 100,000% about the customer. And they don't just say it like we all do. They mean it, and they make it happen. So you feel it as Mr. Love, as we call you, Mr. Liebe, <laughs> as Mr. Liebe and I were talking about earlier, as your experience when you're on certain flights with certain airlines, right? So what this means, I think, for all of us is that we have to sort of step back a little bit and look at our brands and look about how are we treating our brand? What, what's it about? To many, it's not about how we deliver the promise in all aspects of our business. To many, it's about what happens in store what happens on TV commercials, but it may be in the personal relationship with customers in store, wherever that happens, but it's not about the communication. I'm all about the communication. That's my specialty. So we have a scenario where you and I are both gold or platinum or diamond or whatever members of certain airlines, and they treat us like royalty, any kind of royalty, when we are on planes, but when we receive emails and written communication, that's not what we experience. We are treated like anybody else. Has anyone experienced that with airliners, hotels, and that kind of thing? No? Okay, interesting. <laughs> so I think we have to take this serious as well because there are very significant changes in consumer behavior. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about exactly what those changes are, but we all know that, and we have to find out how do we meet these new expectations? What is the new consumer or the updated, upgraded consumer going to expect from our brand now and in the near future? One of the problems, however, we do have to take very seriously is, is what I'm about to explain to you now. Look at this picture. I'd say if you get a seat around this table, you've earned it. Right? It's not like they'll just call Michael Leander in Denmark and say, hey, Mike, come on over to the White House and sit down for a meeting. You know, it's, uh, you, have to, you have earned the right. But look at people here. There's only one guy paying attention. Thankfully, it's the right guy, I'd say. Right? The President of the United States is paying attention, but everybody else is busy doing something else. And before I started my presentation, I was looking around the room, and 40% of you were fiddling with your phone. The rest of you had your phone very close by, ready if something on the phone beeps to engage with it, right? That's the reality we live in. The problem that we have in business today is that people's attention span is now less than the attention span of a goldfish. A goldfish can keep attention for nine seconds, a human being 8.2 seconds. That is a very serious problem. For most things, think about your website. What it really means is that if somebody comes randomly to your website, you have to be able to engage them within eight seconds. Not sell to them within eight seconds, but engage them so that they make a mental decision that they're going to stay and they're going to learn more about what your business and your products are, are all about. This is a really serious challenge. With this comes the need for nudging. Are everyone familiar with the term nudging? Okay, I see 25%, so let me just explain it real quick. So nudging essentially is similar to what they did in Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. Some of you will have heard about this. They had a problem in the men's toilet. I'm speaking fast because I'm wary of the time. They had a problem in the men's toilet. The problem was that men weren't hitting where they were supposed to hit. Ladies, of course, wouldn't know that this is a problem because you never go there. Unlike men, we go, well, that's a different story. So the problem was that because of that, cleaning cost arose, right? So some... Uh, probably former McKinsey guy spotted that and said, we got to do something. They invited a panel in, and one guy came up with this magnificent idea, which was to place a fly, not an actual fly, but they painted a fly in the urinal. And you know men, right, ladies? The moment they come in and say, oh, they, they see that fly on the urinal, so a man is going to go, <coughs> I'm going to get that sucker, I'm going to get that sucker, you know, and now they were able to actually hit 
where they were supposed to hit. That's nudging. That is doing little things to get people to do what you want them to do. It is reminding people of an intent they had at uh, some point in time. With this kind of new behavior amongst consumers, we also have to change our mindset as business people, as marketers, as CEOs, as executives, to one where we start focusing more on reaching the right people. We say we do, we say we care, but reality is, if you ask media agencies, they say, no, it's not true. Because mass marketing communication campaigns are still growing. One size fits all is still dominating. So I say, get away from this uh, counting whoever you reach and get into reach, reaching uh, and measuring, by the way, those who count. I'm going to show you a really quick example of content that matters and mostly to to get you to, to laugh a little bit. There's not necessarily a huge point in this little video, so let's play it. Emma. Huh? Emma. Not anymore. Emma. Every day it's getting on my nerves. Emma. Oh, I'm Emma. Emma? Did a lot of you people have a really bad experience this morning? <laughs> or is it, didn't you see the sign that it's okay to laugh? It was posted outside? Okay. Uh, the reason I wanted to show this actually is to keep in mind that it's content and context that matters and there's no such thing that only digital works. There's no such thing that people don't read magazines, newspapers, watch television, listens to radio any longer. That's BS as they would say in Denmark. Well, we would actually call it out. But uh, I hear we have to be, you know, a little bit more on Danish uh, here. Let me, let me quickly give you some other pointers just to sort of try to set the stage for some things. They also say that by 2020, Customers manage 85% of the relationship that they have with brands without talking to a human. Important, think about machine learning. Ask some of the technology providers about machine learning. What is that? What does that mean for me as a brand? How can that help me provide a more timely, relevant experience with customers and those that are not yet customers with me? Machine learning, check that out. It's happening. If those of you who use Android, check Google today. That's all about machine learning. At the same thing, you have people like SAP, my, my friend Mr. Love over here, who talks about big data. And I say, that's great. Super. Shokran. Woohoo. But only if I have quality small data in place first. Why aren't we caring about the small data? It's not enough to know somebody's name if you want to leverage big data. You've got to know more. What about behavioral? What about all the other aspects of profiling? So if you haven't already asked your teams, whether internally or externally, to start defining your ideal profile, that's really where it starts. Once you have a vision of where you want to go. If you want to continue mass marketing, don't do anything. If you want to get to a point where you're actually doing one-to-one -one communication in a timely and relevant and efficient fashion, then you want to start looking at this right now. There are different ways to build. That's my wife. She hates it when I show her picture. And for that reason, I do it all the time. So if somebody could take a picture of this slide and just post it on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, or any of the dating portals, Nah, this is not the place for my silly jokes. I, I see that. There are three ways to look at your segmentation and your profiling really quick. One is the data that customers give you. You have uh, your wonderful salespeople or whatever you call them in your retail stores. Leverage them as an opportunity to get relevant, updated, and timely information. Behavioral, it's time you get it into play. Online, too. You guys think just because you were born e-commerce that you're masters of this, your communication doesn't show it. So you have to take behavioral seriously as well and ensure that you have the fundamental technologies and skills in place to be able to do that. And finally, get your transactions into place as well. This, I make it sound really easy, don't I? No? I was hoping that I made it sound really easy. Now, I've been working with this, and I don't want to embarrass myself, but really, seriously, since I started business, that's 30 years ago. That's right. 
30 years ago, I've been working with this, and I know it's not easy. But you've got to start somewhere, and like I said before, it starts with the vision and then breaking it into things you can manage, things like the customer journey that we talk so much about, and understand how are you going to wow in terms of communication, your customers before they purchase, during purchase, and after purchase. If you can't do all three, I suggest you start with after purchase. Why? Because then you have insight already. She bought a pair of shoes, they were red, right? That's a lot more valuable to you short term as well as long term than just knowing her intent is to buy that shoe. Does that make sense? At the same time, you want to set up listening systems. I can't say this. Uh, enough. It's so important that you start listening to your customers. But when you do it, do it in an actionable way. Getting big fat reports to tell you that your customer satisfaction is X percent or X score means nothing. What matters is that you get this customer insight so it's addressable, so you can do something about it. I'm not advertising anybody. I don't have shares in any of these companies, but I recommend you to check out two companies. One is All Unite. And the other one is an, a new Indian company, actually, uh, called Litmus World. These are cutting-edge technologies. If you want the links, uh, search Google or something, or, or send me an email to michael at uh, leander.me. Finally, when you look at new opportunities for engagement in-store, make sure that these experiences are integrated with everything else, right? So if you, I don't know, even know in English what you call these things, but if that particular lady has an opportunity to say, I can't buy now, don't want to buy now, but send me a reminder. You want to make sure that this is integrated with the rest of your data. Make sense? Of course it does. We all know this. You're saying, why, what, why is this Michael Leander guy even doing here? Because we all know this. Yeah, I know you know, but you're not doing it. That's why I'm here, to remind you that this should be a priority if you say that you care about giving people an amazing customer experience. So to make it easy for you, look at what you can automate. A lot of this stuff can be automated and should be automated and other stuff not. Look at that as well. So I think that was more than 10 minutes. I do apologize for that. I, 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 I knew from the get-go that this is going to go wrong because I can't, I can't. And, and my English is my fourth language, so I'm really having trouble sometimes, you know, am I even speaking the right language? Let me summarize by saying, it's great to care about your customers. Nothing I think is more important. Certainly as a consumer, for me, my family, my children, etc., we love being cared for by the brands we choose to do business with. But it has to be more than just something you say. You can't, on one hand, deliver an excellent in-store experience, and on the other hand, treat me like a cow. Nothing wrong with cows, Indians. But treat me like a nobody in the direct communication. Are you following me? You just, it doesn't make sense. So if you want uh, to get some more resources, resources about this, contact me at michael at leander.me. Just search Google, and you'll probably find me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Where can I keep you there? Absolutely. Just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm sure we've got questions and comments from the audience. So can I throw the floor open? Anyone with or without a microphone in front of their face? I'll say something. Yeah. So there's a lot of statistics about how you know all interactions are going to take place uh, using uh, technology and so on. Uh, Virgin being a disruptor, we're looking at this completely differently. And uh, what we're seeing with what we call Generation Z or whatever you want to call them, is that in real life is actually very, very important to them. And they're choosing to switch off. This is a trend we're seeing more and more. So our Virgin mobile entities, for example, are struggling with that. And they ran this campaign now where in Australia and a few other places where they're forcing parents to shut off their phones around bedtime. So you have that one hour or two hours where you get to spend quality time with, the, with your kids because we feel like as a brand we hold that responsibility. And we are seeing this trend going forward that the younger generation are, are, need, are having the need to go on adventures, holidays, etc., where they completely switch off. So it's very, very different than the millennials, for example. Um, have you, do you think that this is um, just a wishful thinking or do you really think it's it's going to happen, that people are going to know when to switch off technology? Uh, yeah, I think the answer is yes. 
Uh, but that's what makes this so interesting. So if you, you, the behavior of your primary target audience uh, is like that, you just have to figure out how, how to deal with that. Uh, I think preference is still very important. And that's what you mentioned. You mentioned that people come into your shops three times each week. Was that right? Yes. Uh, that's quite, I mean, insane, actually. So, uh, so that gives you a lot of leverage actually in terms of understanding how to play that, but it's not easy to figure out exactly how to play it, uh, how, how aggressive to be or not, to let them search it yourself, themselves through various applications or social networks or through their communities, or to push. And I think most brands right now are doing this wrong in terms of the pushing part. Uh, they think it's all about pushing. And I think this region, and I should mention all of Asia, actually, this is a huge issue because of lack of data privacy uh, legislation. Maybe not specifically here, but if you look at almost all of Asia, except Singapore, Hong Kong, I think Korea, there's no data privacy legislation. And that opens up for brands. Uh, it's, an it's temptation, I think. It really starts with the boss saying, we need more sales, right? And then it ends up in marketing somewhere and says, but we really shouldn't bombard them one more time this week, but the boss needs sales, so what do you do, right? So uh, I know that was a consulting answer or consultant's answer, <laughs> but your question is typically too difficult for me to give you a spot-on uh, answer at this moment. Thank, Thank you for asking, though, uh, Nisreen. Michael, I, I like that uh, picture you showed about automate in your presentation. You had a picture with a bag and two buttons which said automate a lot of stuff which you can in your stores. Yes. I like that uh, picture and I thought it was very interesting for Kurshi then maybe Thomas if uh, because I go to your stores very often. What do you think of that? I think, isn't that a great idea for uh, I think it's, lifestyle it's stores? It's a fantastic idea. Yeah. I think many of us would agree this morning that Michael hasn't sen said anything new. Um, <laughs> I let, agree. Me, let me complete it, let me complete it. And, you know, a lot of us here claim to be very experienced, uh, some more successful than the others. I think Michael has re-emphasized the fact that we cannot ignore uh, embracing change, moving forward. Uh, Michael has em emphasized again on the fact that we cannot just give a simple uh, or a great store experience without evoking a certain emotion within the consumers or within the customers. And unless that emotion is evoked, there is no loyalty. As I said earlier in my intro, they have a lot of choice. We don't. Thank you. And there's, if there's one message, Michael, you, you yeah. would want to convey to us this morning, based on what you have presented and based on what we have learned from you, what would that be? I, it would be to start with the marketing foundation. So if we look at the communication, whether it's uh, in the mobility space or traditional emails or catalogs or that type of thing, get the foundation in place. And right now the foundation is about data. And then find quick wins. So if we look at email, I think many brands here are also using email. Don't focus so much on your wins, focus more on your losses and what you can do with those losses. So a loss would be people not reacting at all, for example. Figure out why they don't react. In terms of marketing automation, set up quick wins as well. Typically events, if somebody indicate interest in your store but they didn't purchase, set up a, an event for that. Just the small things, if you can't actually go in and look at your whole picture immediately for whatever reason, start looking at the quick wins, but make sure it's always focused on the marketing foundation. Some of the technology providers will hate me for saying this, but I wouldn't make investments as a former CEO of public companies, I just wouldn't allow people to make investments if they couldn't guarantee that we're going to fix our foundation, that we have the right data, that we're acquiring the right data before we invest in this technology. Unfortunately, that's not how most people think. They invest in the technology and then think everything is going to get fixed. It doesn't happen like that. So that would be, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> that would be my one takeaway. Thank you. Okay, guys, the floor's open, but uh, Anita, I think you've got... Yeah, can I ask a question? Um, so traditionally, we, we always produced a catalog or a Lush Times, we used to call it, um, which was effectively a catalog of all of our products. Now, in Europe or in the States, that might work because you can mail them to people's homes, they sit on the coffee table, people browse through them. But here in the Middle East, especially as an electronic generation coming through, um, it's a question really, how, 
how relevant is that going forward? Um, and also from an environmental aspect um, of printing all of those catalogues versus going full electronic. Because um, obviously we spend a lot of money printing them as well. So. Uh -huh. Okay, let me just address that. It's, it's a common mistake. So you want to care about return on marketing investment, assuming that you have cash to invest. You don't really care about what the upfront investment is. What, it, what it's about is knowing your KPIs, how much does it cost me to bring a customer in. So whatever the media doesn't matter. Did, did that make sense? What matters is what is the cost per person in the store to purchase a new product and so on. First thing. Secondly, don't worry so much about the environment. Thirdly, because the impact isn't what you think, but that's a completely different story. Thirdly, thirdly, yes, it still works. Paper still works. And in fact, it's having a renaissance in the US, uh, in Canada, in, all over Europe. You see direct mail, uh, dro door drops, that kind of thing is actually growing. There's a reason for that. And that is because, first of all, it's not as, as competitive anymore as it used to be in the mailboxes and so on. And secondly, in terms of return on marketing investment, it's actually producing much better results, in particular when it's in combination. Right, so your response devices are no longer limited to a coupon that a consumer would return. It's of course integrated with your digital uh, assets as well. So what I would do, uh, I'm not sure, I don't know Lush unfortunately, uh, uh, but I, I think for most what I would recommend if I was asked is test it. Right? Find a subset of existing customers, start with them, not prospective customers, subset of existing customers that are representative of your whole customer base, and then do the split, A-B split test that I think many are familiar with, that you, never mind, that's a long story as well, you do A-B split testing to find out which is, is more effective. Uh, uh, I have clients, I can't mention their name, I only work with a few clients at any given time, but they're currently testing Korea even if it's just an invitation letter with two products on offer inside. It's an actual courier coming to the door saying, hello, <laughs> I have something for you. Uh, I don't know if it's going to backfire because people will expect this is like, oh, finally I won the lottery, right? That's what I would expect if somebody came. And then it's just an offer for an automotive product. But uh, yeah, no, now I revealed it's automotive. So That's a nice idea, though, because if you courier to your existing customer base that you yes. know are going to buy from you anyway, it will return. Absolutely, so and they'll probably also, that's what we learned uh, with what, when, when I helped run Bang & Olufsen as an agency owner. That's what we learned. Even when we uh, farted up, <laughs> we, we had very great customers of Bang & Olufsen who would actually say, you guys, you didn't do, this wasn't too great, what you just did here. Maybe you want to change it in the future. So. Um, I, I hope I'm not taking up too much time here because I know other people have uh, important stuff to share as well. Conversation, so let's continue for a oh, while. Okay. We have a few minutes and I don't think anyone's going to mind if we, uh, okay. if we spill into tea time. Uh, Hannes, you've got your microphone on. Yeah, Michael here. Um, Hi. Mr. Mr. Love. Mr. Love. <laughs> uh, I got a question uh, in regards to your comment on big data versus small data. Uh, because at the same in the same token, we, we, we talk about how we can serve the customer as a segment of one, because this will make the difference. Yeah. Now, I believe small data will not be enough to do this anymore. And uh, it's, the reason is, is that customers interact social, they interact on websites, they interact in the store. And if I'm not bringing this all together, I cannot treat him as a second of one because I don't know whether he has been posting. I have been posting something on Twitter right now about you, right? Nice, uh, uh, nice, yeah? But oh, the thing you. is, if you, you want to know this when you're out there in the coffee corner, because that's when you're interacting with me, Sh not sure. when you're back in Denmark. Yeah. You, you understand? So yeah. th that's why I had, uh, I believe, actually, that big data is absolutely relevant to change the game. I'm not saying it's not relevant. Let me just give you this really quick. I hate to do this, but I, 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 I was just inspired. This is a Qatar Airways Platinum card. That is supposed to mean that you're amongst the most important customers for Qatar Airways. I feel that every time I enter a QR flight, which I obviously do a lot, whether I'm in economy or business. But whenever I look at my inbox, my text messages, whenever I'm in touch with their customer, so-called VIP service, customer service, I feel I am no one. 
that's what I mean by small data. If they can't even, and it, it's not just Qatar Airways, there, it, I can mention Etihad, Emirates, Norwegian Airlines, SAS, Lufthansa, British Airways, Air France, KLM, etc., etc. They all have the same problem. So if they can't even show that they know me, know me in the direct communication, if they don't even understand what my preferences are, what my behavior is, then big data doesn't matter. And there's another problem with this that I think we all can learn from as well. Typically, some companies who invested a lot in social media and understand it's not just a promotional channel. In fact, it's more convenient to leverage social media for customer service, right? To make yourself available to your customers. So some, including Etihad, are really, really great at that. British Airways, American Airlines are really good. So if you post anything on Twitter, you get a response like within one or two minutes. That's absolutely great. And it's a problem for those who don't. But still, you see, you see what I'm saying now? So two minutes on Twitter, let's call that five minutes. Yet, when I call customer service, it's going to take me how long to get an answer? A very long time. Because nobody knows. In particular, if I email with customer service, nobody knows anything. People are directing me to somebody else who can give their answer as well. So I think that is... It doesn't necessarily relate to big data, but that is very important to get into that customer experience uh, equation as well. So I believe big data is extremely important. I think it's getting more important, but I'm advising that we focus on the small things and get them right first, such as what, is my, what are my preferences? What's my actual name? Do I have a family? If I do, how many children do you have? That may, for consumer brands, that may be important and that type of thing. It's the use case. Pardon? It's the use case. It's the use case to the data. You can, uh, thank you, Shun. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that, and as someone alluded to it earlier, is that there's a lot of noise out there um, across multi-channel, and we believe very strongly in multi-channel marketing. Um, and one of the things that we're starting to experiment with, and, and I believe that digital transaction is the key for, in my business in particular, to having that digital relationship with our customers. So you allow them to transact, they have a reason to transact with you and provide you with information that you should take care of and, and not abuse. But one of the things that we're looking at is actually creating um, microsites and micro experiences for within our, our, our user journey that's for very specific user sets. So the idea that we're experimenting with is allow them to discover what they want about our, our business in a, a way that's very particular to them. My question is, have you seen anyone else using this type of approach? Um, so a, an example would be uh, we want to use um, SAP as a, we want to attract them as a corporate customer. So do we create a microsite for SAP uh, users and we offer them specific things that are relevant to them yeah. in their communities and things like that? Yeah. Uh, have you seen this elsewhere? Because we're starting to do it and we believe it's a good idea. But um, It's a very good idea. I don't know about SAP. It's not an endorsement <laughs> of an SAP, <laughs> but, uh, but Mr. Love is here and he's very competent <laughs> and uh, so he can answer those questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and so I don't, do not want to offer you to send you a bunch of case studies because that would conflict with uh, Mr. Love and I don't want to lose him as a friend now that I just found him. <laughs> um, but uh, so you are on B2C, right? Uh, yes. And the product is? Pizza. So we, we're, deliver Pizza, eh? we're, we're a delivery company, 95% um, okay. delivery. So, but one of the things that we're seeing is that there's a lot of noise and, you know, and, and we, we do a lot of community work with our customers and in the communities that we yeah. operate in because yeah. we're a delivery company. Yeah. But there are you know, some pretty big market users out there yeah. and we're a very universal product. So can we you know, create something that's discoverable Absolutely. for specific uh, subsets to allow them, to give them something to tell others and then we can continue to harvest a that absolutely. data? Absolutely, I think that's a short answer. One, one you, could, you could look at the EasyJet. I know it's not pizza, <laughs> it's something a little bit different. Uh, there is a case study, it's public, uh, that shows how they've increased sales by just amazing numbers, percentage-wise as well as in real numbers. Um, anything you can do pretty much to show me, let's say I come to your site and I'm Michael Leander and I have this history of ordering pizzas. Uh, anything that you can show me that I immediately recognize as relevant to me. That could be my past orders, that could be a recommendation since you bought this, the Quattro stagioni or whatever it's called in pizza and it was family size with cokes on the side or whatever uh, you give me an opportunity to order that uh, uh, quickly or to let me explore something that's relevant to my usage situation which for me would be with wife and a, and a pair and three children 
right? So I don't want to hear about uh, offers that are relevant to, to single men, for example. So I would uh, encourage you to move ahead because you will increase sales if you implement this, even in the, uh, let's say, in, in the in, in the starting, uh, starting phase is what I want to say. It doesn't have to get super, super advanced because people are so, you, you mentioned noise. The problem with noise is not noise. The noise is a problem because it's irrelevant, right? Most of what we're seeing out there is irrelevant to us at the time we're exposed to that message. So whatever you can do to make it more relevant, uh, the better. Is that we, I don't know if other people see that in, in this room as well, that social media you know, has generally been seen as, you know, we'll beat our chests and we'll have a conversation and, and we'll be transparent. But there's so many people on social media, so many people following so many things um, that the relevancy becomes very challenging. And what, we're, what we believe is that if we can get more people to give them relevant things on our to interact with us in a relevant way on our digital uh, interfaces, that that would be, have a stronger impact than sort of more broadcast type um, uh, social media. Without presence. question, but keep in mind everyone, uh, I think some of you have maybe have made a decision that social media is not going to bring you any real value, but I think it's going to change. If you look at what Facebook, um, Instagram, Pinterest, et cetera, et cetera, are doing in terms of integrating uh, the e-commerce bit, and it's happening right now in North America and other select countries. I think over the next year, we're going to see a lot of development in social that's finally going to be able to make us able to generate a significant return on marketing investment. And then the question is then, how do we integrate that channel with every else, uh, everything else that we are doing? Especially if you have many stores, for example, how do you handle that? Because one store owns one territory and you might not be able to do that level of segmentation on, on a Facebook or, or any other channel for that matter. But I like your thinking and I wish more people would do it, not for my sake, but because it, it's really a great way to service your customers and make them come back and more profitable and the lifetime value of a customer is just gonna increase if you show your care, it's as simple as that. Even when you get it wrong, show your care by asking uh, how can we do better next time? Uh, and apologize for whenever we do wrong, and it happens to everyone. It's impossible not to fail once in a while, as I have done miserably with my time uh, keeping here today. <laughs> I do apologize for that. Well, what I'm... Hi, Debbie? Right. Yeah, I'd like to share um, something from our um, perspective as a cinema operator, something that we're seeing with social media, and we're, we're not intro... We, we put a lot of movie trailers out to engage the, the customer, but with, I mean, we have a very geeky head of digital who has done an amazing job for us since he's been on board. But for him, it's not about getting the likes, it's absolutely about the engagement. And sometimes on a posting he puts, he'll have 2,000 people engaging with him and he will respond to each and every one of those. Excellent. And they feel so special. And we feel when the customers, that we get comments all the time, I feel that uh, Nova cares about us. They know about us, they want to get to know us, they want to, know, to understand what makes us tick, what we want, what our, our needs are when we come to the cinema. So despite it being time consuming, we really see true benefit in, in, in investing long term in making sure that each and every customer counts. Thank you so much for saying that, Debbie, because that is just such an amazing point. Um, I can say that I've worked with a very large telco. They are also the market leader in Egypt. So when something goes wrong, a lot of people, I mean a lot, 2,000 would be a small number, but of course they have a much bigger market and so on. And uh, at one point in time, this particular telco thought that it wasn't necessary to answer everyone. But of course it is. And that goes as well when it's positive comments. People give co positive comments not always just to show support. They think it's a way of engaging in conversation, isn't that right? So, so when I tell you what a beautiful uh, blue dress, uh, I'm not satisfied if you just say thank you and then I can walk away. I want a little bit more. I want you to say, oh, thank you. I just bought it. Where did you buy it? You know, it's an opportunity for us to get into a conversation. And the same thing is happening on social media. It's an extremely important point. And so what that means to everyone here is really to make sure you have the resources to be able to respond to people in social media. Okay, maybe I'm actually going to give you the floor a little later. Uh, yes, I'll take 30 seconds. Okay. You know, the, the classical debate about online and 
what Nisreen said, the in-store experience. Uh, I'll go to examples. Recently, you must have seen that Walmart. Can you can you move a little closer to the microphone, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, recently, you must have seen newspapers that Walmart is now struggling because they have not invested enough in online portal, and they always believe that brick and mortar is the way to go about it, and so now they're investing. Now, if you look at uh, Barnes and Barnes and Nobles, about 10 years ago. They failed, their business is threatened because online people will start online eating and they will be out of business. But they continue to be strong, they're growing. How a company decides which way to go about and at what stage they will make the investments? This is a you know, lot of companies we talk to because in our role we talk to a lot of companies. They always struggle with, with this decision. They, should you go brick and mortar, stay with that so that customer gets the experience or we go and invest in online portal and make that channel pop popular. Okay, so I just want to make a point that although I may look geeky, uh, it's not that I am 100% digital. I started my career in, in traditional. I still very much believe in that. But I was also part of the e-commerce revolution, if you will, in Europe and having built the first B2B e-commerce portal in Europe in 1995. So uh, what I've learned in those 20 years is that you want to get started early, but maybe with a limited investment. Because it's not so much about the investments in technology and all of that. It's as much about the investment in people. And many businesses don't necessarily just want to hire geeks because they can't handle geeks. And geeks don't know everything. Geeks perhaps might not have the same respect for customers, might not understand communication and the subtlety of communication and so on. So I think it's important to get started early. But I think it's also important if you have a limited investment that you communicate that to people. Right? That uh, at Virgin, we currently do not have this and that going on, but you could come to the store. You said 300,000 products, for example, right? So, so that would be vice versa, right? We don't have everything in the store, but you could go to our online channel. So in Can I also comment on that Absolutely. Question? Yeah. So I would argue that probably, you know, uh, online has been around since, what, 95, 96, you know. Yeah, I think the first, uh, 1994, yeah. And of course, for a long period of time, there was extreme panic on behalf of companies. You have to go online. Whether it made sense to you or it didn't, Barnes & Noble is one of those examples. BN.com went on and sp uh, spun off as a publicly traded company, but it always had its issues. Many other companies launched online, and it was the death of them. I think what we're seeing now is that companies are becoming practical. And it all depends. Are you a publicly traded company? How will people look at your finances? Uh, how, will the, how will the shareholders look at that? I'll use an example. Uh, in the UK, um, all uh, you know, it's, it's basically supermarket wars, one after the other. And now the Germans have come in, so that's made oh. things much, much worse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very, very uh, crunched margins. A very, maybe number four down the list after, you know, Tesco, Sainsbury's, etc., is the co-op. And they have, I don't know, 500, 600 locations all over the UK. Um, they made a decision last week or two weeks ago that they're not going to go online, even though Amazon is now online, etc., because they said nobody's making money in online grocery delivery. And our goal as a publicly traded company is to deliver top line and to deliver net profit. And the reaction from the markets was actually incredibly positive. It, it, uh, their market share went up because they made that decision. I think 10 years ago, they would have been penalized if they said that they weren't going to go online. So it's lucky that, that we're in a place now where uh, we can do whatever makes sense to our business, uh, for our margins, and the customer and the market will understand. I, I do have to say that it, it is a point, but only for that industry. I cannot think of other industries that wouldn't have a scenario where customers at one point or another would expect to find them. I say online. When I say online, I mean find them in the mobility space, because that's where we're heading for, right? It really is about the mobility space, that we have our handheld devices, whatever they may be, and that we have come to expect that we can interact with companies that w this way. For that reason, I say, outside of, of that industry, I say it really is a matter of getting started. And then listening to your customers, of course, will help you tremendously understand what level of investment is required. Unfortunately, a lot don't actually ask their customers. They do the Steve Jobs trick, or let's say the supposed Steve Jobs trick. 
which, which suggests that customers don't know what they want, so we'll just innovate and develop and then launch it and then expect it to be successful. I think it's really important to listen to customers. Let me give you a quick example, if I may. Cornfuss, which is not B2C, it's mostly B2B, it's the world's largest pump manufacturer. They wasted 3 million euro uh, in 1995 to 1997 on launching a site with as without asking a single customer of theirs what they wanted. As a result, technical manuals was not part of the website. Th pumps, think about it. Pumps, engineers who install pumps, they probably w would want technical manuals, right? But it was not on the website. So, I so as a result, the whole website had to be rebuilt, and that was good for me, but bad for whoever made the initial investment. I think you should ask customers, and that's what we did. And as a result, we got a much, much better website that was more integrated as well with their ERP, CRM, uh, and so on. Okay, we've got time for a couple of more points. So, uh, Otto, I'm going to throw it to you. Yeah, if I might just touch upon uh, the online space, e-commerce, and also social media interaction. Now, we're in the leather business, and yes, I know, uh, we have uh, predominantly uh, been a brick and mortar business. I mean, I hold a leather, leather notebook over here. The feel, the touch, the smell, that's probably one of the more important aspects when you make a buying decision. However, having said that, today 20% of our sales are from online platforms, e-commerce. And over the last year, it has risen by 130%, just over one year. So what we have done is try to create that communication between how to get this online customer base to actually translate in an offline traffic as well. So we launched this campaign called The Art of Reuse. So what it probably does is also do with our sustainability efforts. So all the cut leather pieces from our factories are put together. We run a campaign every year. It runs across two months. Then we hold this competition. Anyone who is interested to come into any of our factories, they're welcome. They're given a, a needle and a thread. They can actually handcraft a piece of article. We then take it back brand it for them, take images, upload it to our websites, Twitter, Facebook accounts, and then our online, online fans or followers, what they do is they actually vote for the products. Mm. So in turn, we're trying to create that ownership, not only of the product, but the fact that whether you be online or whether you be one of our walk-in brick and mortar customers, mm. we still try our best to keep that engagement flowing. I believe, uh, you know, although we initially did not believe in online, but right now we see that it can, it can really translate into uh, the conventional uh, business. For sure, and I think vice versa as well. I happen to know high design, and I've been uh, pretty angry with, uh, with you guys twice. Okay. Uh, both times bef because I couldn't get the product I came to the shop to get. Once in Delhi, and I think the other time was in Mumbai, right? So there's an opportunity, isn't there? Of course, the, the sales rep was very apologetic and asked me to come back a week later, which I couldn't because I travel all the time. So if you find a way to integrate that scenario as well to your digital and, and marketing efforts, we talked about triggers before, right? So that's a perfect moment to use a trigger to have a system where you could actually notice that Michael Leander will need that back, but not in brown, in black. Right, that was the concrete scenario. I wanted a black, a very, very beautiful, uh, handcrafted. Uh, you guys, you do wonderful stuff. You really do, I have to say. Uh, almost as good as those guys in Pakistan. Maybe it's the same. Ah, uh, challenge. <laughs> I forgot their name, but anyhow. Um, that's a moment, right? Because it happens all the time that somebody comes to the shop because they wanted something specific in a specific color or maybe a specific size. How do we communicate when that product then lands in the shop? And how do you, okay, I'm not going to get too advanced here, but how does that CRM bit or wherever you, however you, whatever system you have to run customer programs, how does that integrate with ERP uh, so that we know when that black bag enters that particular shop? Because obviously you want to give commission to the salesperson who went through the trouble of handling me, handling the disappointment, logging it in the system, right? Uh, so there's a personalization that goes two-way here that I think is very important for retail in particular, which is to tie the customer with a specific salesperson. So my, my wife, she runs a retail operation which is in the luxury premium segment, and they have this problem all the time. Uh, and this is in Denmark. It's not in India. There's nothing wrong with India, nothing wrong with Denmark, but uh, let's just say the salary levels are slightly different. But still, these ladies, they are fighting over customers, high 
high, what do you call it, high value customers, right? They'll actually try to steal customers from one another, right? And that's something you have to deal with as well, so that you make sure that you, uh, that you respect whoever did the job to actually get the sales, right? Uh, so so Oh, you do? Excellent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this over to Mark. We've got a fairly, we've got a, a great, uh, we've got a great conversation that's going to happen on technology. So, are we talking technology, or are we are we talking about everything else? Technology. Technology. Can I hold that for the afternoon? Yeah, um, because we do have a session on technology and retail coming up, uh, and I suspect we're all going to need a cup of coffee fairly soon. So, Mark, you get the last word, and then I'll throw it open to a, to a tea break. Thanks very much for that. And yes, I'll, I'll moderate the technology session uh, later on this afternoon. Um, just thank you, Michael. There's some great, uh, excellent points in there. My concern, I think, over in, in a lot of the conversations we have is that we almost treat the customer as their mobile device. We, we, we talk about digital all the time and our digital engagement with the customer. And actually, I'm not a digital customer. Yes, I've got a mobile phone. Yes, I've got iPads and all the, all the other. But actually, I'm a real person. And, and sometimes I think we forget the staff uh, and the face-to-face -face engagement. We talked about uh, the importance of making a customer feel special. Well, nothing can make you feel more special than a member of staff welcoming you or, or, or treating you well. And that's where you get the best experiences. Um, uh, just to come back on the point about the co-op in, in the UK, um, the, the issue there, I think, is about businesses understanding what business they are actually in. And co-op have looked at that very carefully. They could try and follow the rest of the supermarkets, but actually co-op is not a supermarket. Co-op is a convenience uh, store brand. Uh, and they've realized that actually the vast majority of customers come to them for uh, unplanned shopping, convenient shopping. Basically, you remember you need something. Now, that if you're going to go online, you're probably not going to go to the co-op. Hence, it certainly wouldn't be profitable for them. Uh, and then add in all of the home delivery or click and collect and all of the different things that need to be around that. But I think whichever retail business you're in, the first step, before you even build your vision, is to realize what business am I actually in? And then I can start looking at, okay, what's the vision of that? How will that business change over the next few years? And then what are my customers going to do and what technology can help? So even though I'm a technology uh, company <laughs> rep, the reality is technology comes at the back end of it in terms yeah. of that's just helping me get to where I want to be. Completely agree. And I also agree what you said about staff. I think it's, it's very um, sad that in, I guess, all over the world, we don't invest enough in staff because we're afraid they're just going to take the free education, so to speak, and then leave us. But it's proven time and time again, the more you invest in your staff, show, them, show that you believe in them, the longer they will actually stay and the more they will contribute. But also make sure that they're channel agnostic as well, right? So you don't have the two or three or four channels fighting over one another. You want the person in store to support whatever you offer in the other channels as well and uh, vice versa. Because it really is about what's most convenient for our, the customer. And some days it's online, right? And other times we actually do, do want to go talk to a product expert in the store to get all the information we need to make a purchase uh, decision. So I absolutely agree with you. Thank you, Michael. We're going to be talking more about technology, as I said, later in the afternoon. We're also going to be talking about retail in the GCC. That's coming up uh, right after we take a quick break for, uh, for coffee. But before we break, um, I would like to introduce Mona Ataya, um, who wasn't here when I went around the room the first time around. Mona, say hello to the room. Tell us who you are. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mona Ataya. I'm the founder and CEO of mumsworld.com. Uh, Mumsworld is a pure play e-commerce vertical for mother, baby, and child shopping. We are now uh, four years old, and we're the largest pure play for this vertical in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I suggest a 15-minute break for coffee and then come back to where we were? Yes? Thank you.